Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. So I turn up sound. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to the cabinet meeting uh, of Wednesday, the 16th of October. Please be advised this meeting will be recorded and posted on the council's YouTube channel. Can all those speaking ensure you switch on your microphone before addressing the meeting and remember to switch it off when you have finished speaking. When voting, can members please raise their hand? Now, as you can see, I'm speaking uh, with an almost elevated voice. Uh, it's because the sound and we've had some technical difficulties. So can I ask everyone to try and speak up in the chamber as much as possible so that everyone is able to hear? Item one, apologies for absence. Councillor Kyra. Thank you, Chair. Apologies for leaving early. Okay. Item two, urgent business. There is no urgent business. Item three, does any member have any personal or financial interest to declare on any item on the agenda? See none. Item four, is Cabinet happy to agree the minutes of the last meeting? Item five, asset review initial outcomes. To approve the freehold or long lease hold disposal of the properties listed in section 4.9 of the report and detailed in appendix one of the report. Um, we'll now open for a briefing from the cabinet member and the uh, officers. Councillor Raman. Thank you, Chair. And just before I start, I should have mentioned it earlier, I will occasionally st um, stand up. Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, just to mention that I will be uh, br um, occasionally standing up and walking around just because I've got a really bad back, so just to, not to put anyone off and just explain. Um, um, but I'll have to do that every, every, occasionally. But yeah, just to come back to the item itself. Oh, I feel like I'm really loud already. Um, but yeah, come back to the asset review. So just to bring to everyone's attention that the asset review uh, has been done uh, in, in, in consideration of, uh, so this is our initial um, kind of outcomes of the asset review and, and the assets that are being considered for disposal uh, as a part of a, a wider review that will be ongoing to ensure that we um, sweat our assets and get the best possible um, returns for um, disposal of these assets. And, and bearing in mind the kind of the, the, the financial um, and the economical situation that we're in currently, it's very important that we um, manage our, uh, our assets to ensure um, those that um, sorry. So, sorry, I don't know why I'm having a bit of a brain freeze. Um, so, I'll sit back down. Yeah. Sorry, just uh, the, the, the back is kind of tormenting me a bit today. But um, so, just going back to the asset review, um, it's very important that, to bear in mind that our officers um, and our teams have worked really hard to make sure a a a, a thorough uh, list of assets which will which have been considered for disposal, and these have been done through a, a an, an outside consultant to ensure that um, we have thoroughly um, considered the, the sites and sweated the, uh, the assets before putting them off for disposal. And these uh, these the aim is to kind of create savings, but also um, create future revenues um, for our midterm financial review. And I will pass it over to the officer to kind of take it on from there. Thank you. Thank you. And just a reminder to everyone in the meeting, the mics aren't working as well. So for those at the back of the room, that's why I'm asking everyone to speak louder. Thank you. I'll now hand over to officers. Carol, can you hear me? I'm, I'm just checking whether you can hear me. Do you want a hearing loop? Do you want a hearing loop? 
Okay. 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 Th thank you, Chair, and can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, and thank you, Councillor Rahman. So this report is the first of what will be several reports that bring forward recommendations which reflect how the Council is adapting and changing the way it delivers services, as well as optimises the performance of our property assets that we own or make recommendations that dispose of those assets for alternative uses. Our recommendations are in line with the Council's agreed property strategy that was adopted in 2019 and is currently being updated and will be considered by Cabinet separately. The Council has a significant portfolio of property assets, some of which generate an income and some that cost the Council money or require extensive investment in order to improve their condition. Holding on to assets that cost the Council money or are not performing well or are not serving a, a service use is not something that the Council can afford to do. It's essential that the Council considers how it can right-size the property portfolio to ensure that poorly performing assets are identified and appropriate recommendations are made. Officers have undertaken an initial review of all of the Council's assets, applying some key principles. So the first key principle is to maximise revenue from our potential assets, and by this I mean charging the market rent for a property we let. Assets identified for disposal will need to be considered to be sold for best consideration reasonably obtainable. Secondly, Identifying assets that don't have an adverse impact on service delivery. So by this I mean that officers have considered assets, whether they can be repurposed for other uses where it's cost effective to do so, before we bring forward recommendations to, for Cabinet to agree a disposal. So an example of this is sites that are repurposed, such as former premises houses, premises managers' houses, that are now being used for temporary accommodation and saving the council money. I can also assure everybody that we have consulted our colleagues in transport in relation to car parks, because of which there are three on the list, to look at their usage, and we've looked at them at different days, times on different days of the week, and we're continuing to do so. We've also looked at the impact in terms of the um, displacement potentially, whilst they're small in number in terms of the car park spaces, what impact that might have in the overall area. And we're also considering the recommendations in light of the Council's transport strategy and the carbon neutral plan. The third principle that we've considered is that making sure that assets that we bring forward don't restrict our future regeneration ambitions. An example of this would be land that the Council has acquired in Charlton Riverside, which we're not at this point recommending for disposal because of our future regen ambitions. And finally, the fourth principle is making sure that what we bring forward is realistic and deliverable. Because disposals take time, but we know that the, um, the finances of the Council, we need to be able to plan accordingly in terms of understanding what our potential revenue impact will be as well as capital receipt will be. And this will help protect services and minimise cuts or changes to services arising from the Council's financial pressures. In, in subject to the agreement today, in terms of next steps, the timing of each disposal to the, when we bring a disposal to the market will be considered in consultation with the leader and the cabinet member. The existing use, so in the exact case of a car park, for example, where the site is being used, even if it's limited, will remain as the current use until such time as the disposal is completed. I know that Carol from the Charlton Society is here today and you're going to make um, some comments and questions about the Charlton Village car park, which we'll respond to once you've had the opportunity to speak. And I'm happy to take any questions from members if they'd like. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I will now open for questions from uh, the Cabinet. Councillor Kaira, please Cabinet indicate. Councillor Lacau. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you so much for the reports, very detailed, and thank you so much for your presentation, both of you. My question would be around, you mentioned that you have been working closely with your transport colleagues. 
Um, can you give a little bit more context around that regarding what kind of work has gone on just to make sure that these items are can, can go to the disposal list or something that we can work with? Yeah. So, so what we do is we, um, when we identify an, an asset and whether it's performing, we look at the metrics of that asset in terms of the financial performance, what the costs are, such as utilities, business rates, all of the things that the council might incur, what the condition of that asset is, and then what potential or current income is it deriving. So, and then we um, talk to all of our colleagues to understand um, what demands are there from property in relation to service need? So, for example, we talk to children's services in your portfolio to understand what school or education need that there might be before we bring something forward for consideration. In relation to the car parks, as I mentioned, the um, usage has been monitored on different days of the week, different times of the day, and that will continue to be done. But it shows that there is low usage, and the cost versus income is, um, is why the recommendation has been brought forward, because they are, have very low usage and therefore very low income. And in Charlton Village's case, for example, uh, they've had trouble, the colleagues in transport have had trouble enforcing there, and the um, signs have been sprayed out, for example. And so as a result, the councils have to spend money in terms of installing cameras to capture um, who's using the car park. And again, it shows, despite the vandalism of the signs, it's showing that there is very low usage. So it's a high cost to have a camera for a very low usage and that there is, um, there is uh, good connectivity in the area in terms of public transport, as well as um, the small number of car parking spaces that if it was fully utilized, wouldn't overburden the neighboring area. So that's how we go about it. But we're very much working with our colleagues across the council. Councillor Lacau. <coughs> Thank you, Pippa, for, for that, because I just wanted to reiterate I just wanted to reiterate the fact that um, our transport strategy clearly states that we want to reduce the number of car miles um, in the borough. It also um, alludes to the fact that transport is a high emitter of carbon in the borough. So in order for us to meet our carbon neutral plan, these kind of considerations have taken place. And um, keeping a car park for its own sake is just not tenable in the financial um, situation that this council finds ourselves. I mean, I feel it's really important that we use our assets to the best um, we can in order to um, try and plug some of these gaps. And quite frankly, the amount of vandalism that has taken place since we started to um, try and um, put some charging in that car park um, is, is, is costing us more than we get back. So, you know, I'm, I'm certainly I've looked at all the evidence and I'm really satisfied that um, it has undergone um, the appropriate checks. Thank you. And uh, I'll come back for comments. Um, I have a question myself um, on, obviously, um, the decision put before us today means that we're looking at using our assets better. But of some of the assets that we're looking at disposing of, so let's say, for instance, from a development perspective, if someone was to purchase them at a certain cost, is there any opportunity uh, uh, through development where there's an uplift of cost that the council would benefit from that despite the sale? Thanks for the question. Um, I think the issue with that is as soon as you fetter the uh, sale of the property by putting in something like a clawback or overage clause, which you're suggesting, you're going to reduce the uh, likely number of bidders and also the amount of money they're willing to pay. Um, so there's a balancing act to be had here. I think if the council feels like there is a significant added value to be had out of a property, then um, yes, maybe. But I think we need to be really careful that we don't fetter disposal because then we cut across best consideration. And just on that last point, rather than putting overage at the end, is does, 
is there a point over which we consider towards the end post sale or if something else happens well as I say only if you did something in the disposal uh, agreement in the first place so if okay. you're effectively conditioning a land disposal then um, and you're starting to narrow down the amount of money and the interests that you would get um, so yeah you'd have to consider that at the beginning in the disposal point thank you right we will now um, invite um, Carol uh, who also has a uh, um, We'll now invite Carol Keener from the Charlton Society um, to speak for two minutes uh, as we have received a request. Please, could you receive, turn on your microphone and then we'll go from there. Right. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah? Oh, that's good. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, and first of all, um, I just wanted to say that I understand the problems that the council are facing and um, hopefully what I'm going to say might suggest some ways that we can help with this problem rather than, rather than cause an additional problem. However, saying that, the, the report you've received states that the two car parks are not uh, very well used and as a result don't generate very much uh, revenue. However, um, that isn't quite the case. There are two car parks, one to the left of Torrance Close, uh, which is behind some residential property. That certainly is not well used, but the one that is adjacent to the assembly rooms is used fully, uh, and in particular is used by um, uh, users of the assembly rooms looking, uh, looking after the needs of people with learning difficulties who actually require um, special transport to get to and from the venue. Um, the, at the weekend, the rooms are fully uh, utilised by a variety of organisations and um, not only are the car parks used, despite them having been designed to make them very difficult to access, um, and uh, the, the adjacent roads are full as well. We, we believe that, in fact, um, we're not sure, in fact, whether uh, the land is um, the council's at the moment, because it is part of the overall property of um, the uh, Royal Greenwich Heritage Trust and as such is under the auspices of, of themselves and is part of a collection of grade listed buildings. The rooms themselves are grade two listed. Um, Charlton House is grade one listed. St. Luke's Church is Grade 2 listed, and the, valley, uh, the village as a whole is a conservation area. Um, it also doesn't uh, recognise that uh, the village as a whole has been listed as at risk by Heritage England since 2017 and was updated in 2020. The um, the village is beset by traffic, um, particularly at commuting times, and is, as it is one of the few direct routes to the A2 and access into central London. And one of the big problems for the village, which the uh, Charlton Society has been trying to combat for a number of years, is that uh, shops in the village uh, don't use the service roads for their deliveries. They pick, uh, park in the high street and we have been trying to persuade them to use the service roads, leaving the high street as a completely f free thoroughfare. If you remove this, um, the assembly rooms are part and parcel of the Heritage Trust 
financial plans for making the um, Charlton the House viable? Round up because of your meeting your time. So if you just finish on that last sentence, and then we go from there. Okay. Um, just I. Uh, I was on my last point anyway, but which is that what needs to be done is seen, see the village, Charlton House, the assembly rooms, the car park as a whole. Personally, I think that with um, Charlton Village is recognised as an urban village and is a good a tourist draw as Greenwich Town, and we should be looking at that. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you for your contributions. Um, I will now open from comments and obviously once we everyone's made their comments and uh, we can round up and let um, our directors also come in for comments. Any comments at all? Councillor um, Cousins, Councillor Kyra and Councillor Lodovar. Uh, thank you Chair. I, I think it's important to thank Carol for um, coming in. We don't often get visitors to Cabinet, so it was refreshing, and, and thank you for your presentation. I do believe that in the report, Louder, please. I do believe that in the report there is a, a caveat about potential limitations, so although a site has been identified. I, I do think that um, it, so if those, um, I mean, officers will speak for themselves, but perhaps they will have to take into account what you're saying about um, listed buildings status and the whole historic Charlton um, look. But one of the things I just wanted to say is that for me, I think it is important that we look at the better use that we can get out of certain assets. My only concern would be that as necessary, we are liaising with local people, everything won't be done en masse, but when you're looking at a certain thing, that the local council, the ward councillors and the local groups that it will impact are definitely consulted. So although it's a plan, um, at this stage we're just agreeing to that, we don't necessarily know how each and every single item will finally pan out. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cousins. Councillor Kyra? Uh, thank you, Chair. I uh, welcome this report because I uh, understand how difficult we are financially as a local council and the difficulties that we have to go through to find savings. I know some of the stuff in there might not be, you know, everybody's cup of tea, but we are facing challenges in children's services, you know, to find care places and the cost for our young people. I know council, a lot of us finding difficulties in their services, and that's why we have to make tough decisions to protect frontline services. And this is some of the stuff that we're gonna do, and there's probably more coming to our next budget rounds that we have to do. There is not an easy decision, but I welcome this report and I welcome the decision, Chair. Thank you very much. Councillor Lolliver. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, uh, following Councillor Kyra, in the same vein. I, I wanted to speak to the item as well specifically because I had a few residents that had written to me in regards to this decision. And I, and I guess I wanted to provide my response. Um, Ultimately, it's not the position that we want to be in, but it's the reality, I think, of the situation that we're in. We're seeing councils failing and filing for bankruptcy all over the UK, and that is not the position that we want to be in. At the last budget, we were making cuts in the region of £33 million, and we've got more that will be coming. So in light of the economic realities that we've inherited, these are the decisions that we have to make. Um, and I think for exactly as Councillor Kyra has said, it's about safeguarding and protecting vital services. Um, and for me, these lettings and sales will all help bring in the, the investment that we need to either plug that budget gap and prevent us from having to make further cuts in services that, um, uh, that residents hold dear. Um, so I see this as, 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 you know, the sad reality that we're in, but it is the right decision to be making. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Lolliver. Um, just before I make my comments, I wanted to ask officers if they wanted to come in to address some of the points uh, uh, Carol made at all. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, firstly, thank you very much for addressing the, the uh, Cabinet, um, Carol. And I know you've taken a long interest in Charlton and Charlton Riverside, so uh, your local knowledge is really appreciated. I think the important thing for Cabinet to remember is this is not a change of use planning application. This is about the disposal of two land assets. 
Um, now the purchaser or would-be purchaser might choose to use it for car parks if it's viable um, or they might choose to redevelop and then it would be into the planning system where the uh, points you raise about the listed buildings and the adjacency would be material considerations as part of that planning determination. Um, and I think um, to clarify the car parks are in the demise of the council and they're not in the demise of the Royal Greenwich Heritage Trust, which uh, the red line demise it relates to the building only, not the car park. Um, and I, I thank you for raising the issue about trans transport and particularly service deliveries in the village. I've witnessed that myself. Um, and um, thanks to Councillor Lacau and her colleagues, um, they're picking that up in terms of enforcement because uh, Torrance Close um, and Fletchling Road will remain open as service roads and should be used as service roads. So the council will try and manage that situation um, through traffic enforcement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's fair to say that um, on balance the decision before us seems a sensible one in light of uh, our current financial position. But actually one thing we need to consider is how we effectively manage our estate. And I believe officers have spoken today about the update to the asset management strategy, which will inform decisions um, that come forward. One thing that I guess I want to emphasize is uh, the need for us to really develop a case around meanwhile use and how we use assets uh, in, in the meantime to make sure that we can support our, our, our communities. Um, in the wider point, I presume that strategy will be able to inform future decisions. Look, we don't want to be in a position of selling, uh, selling, selling the silver almost, or, or can I say it like that? But I think on, on, on balance, the decision between today is about we're putting 23 sites recommended to be let, 11 to be sold. So there's a real balance there of saying actually, where we see value in letting our assets, we will do that. Where we see value in selling certain assets, we will do that. And where we see value in holding on to assets and using them to deliver for housing, children's services, we will do that. So I'm grateful to the work that your department has done, coordinating with all council departments to make sure there's an effective use of our asset management strategy and as well as our um, assets. Um, do members have any other further questions before I close this area? Um, are members happy to agree to the decisions as outlined in section 1.1 to 1.5 of the report? Thank you very much. We'll now move on to item six, which is the annual housing compliance <laughs> report. Uh, first of all, we note the apologies of the cabinet member, uh, as I know she's unwell. Um, so this is to note the performance with regard to the big six housing safety compliance areas, to note the update regarding damper mold, uh, to note the update regarding damper mold within the council old homes, and to note the summary of activity to ensure compliance with the requirements of the social housing ombudsman and the regulator of the social of social housing. Um, We'll now move on to a briefing from officers, but uh, the cabinet member has circulated some words uh, to share. Cabinet will be aware that, right, that we rightly reported ourselves to the social housing regular in May 2022 for breaches of some safety compliance requirements. We have been working closely with the regulator ever since. I am pleased that the report shows very significant improvements in our performance around safety messages m m matters. See 4.5 for the detail. Officers will shortly explain our work in a bit more detail, and I'd like to thank these officers and their teams for the extraordinary work in this area. This work helps us deliver our mission that people in Greenwich have access to a safe and secure home. The report before you now is part of our governance arrangements and assurance, which includes an annual report to Cabinet. Although not formally part of what we report to the regulator on, we have added our response to damper mould to this work and the report. We have put in additional capacity and now have a team of seven 
responding to reports of damp and mould, helping us speed up our initial response to mould and follow up work on the root causes of damp. Finally, we have agreed into this report our work on complying with new stricture building safety regulations, especially for our 67 high-rise blocks. I'll now hand over to officers to open with their presentation. Thank you, Chair, and I'll speak up. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, as um, you said through the words of the Cabinet member, um, this is the pinnacle of the assurance regime that you as a Cabinet set up now um, nearly four years ago, and that regime requires an annual housing safety and compliance report to be considered by Cabinet, and the regime as a whole is giving assurance to yourselves, to the full council, to residents, and also to other third parties, such as the regulator for social housing, um, that, are, that the buildings that we look after, the homes that we look after for residents, are, are managed in a safe way, and, um, and we are um, in compliance or moving towards full compliance with the um, consumer standards that are set out in the report. So, quite an important moment for you to consider as, as a Cabinet. I'm going to draw attention just to four things, just to focus, focus Cabinets um, in. Um, firstly, as, as your introduction from the Cabinet member set out, Chair, um, we are working through um, the regulatory notice that was issued to us just over two years ago, and we have made significant progress around the concerns raised in that regulatory notice. We have monthly meetings with the regulator of social housing, and um, they um, benchmark and check in on that progress on, on, on that monthly basis. And as the report sets out, we have made considerable progress um, to, to um, discharge all those concerns we haven't finished yet, and in particular, we're working through our final electrical safety certification and also our fire risk assessment actions, and the report goes into that detail. I'm happy to answer questions, but um, that's, that's significant um, progress being made. Um, the new consumer standards obviously go beyond building safety, and um, there are four particular areas which are, are referenced in section 4.30 of the report where we know that um, we need to make more progress and we have action plans and work streams around those four areas. Our stock condition data, um, our, the vulnerability of our residents and the data we have around the vulnerability of our residents, the work we do um, around antisocial behaviour and, um, and formalising the significant work that already happens around tenant engagement and, and, and resident um, involvement. So um, that will be work that you will all be hearing about over the next, over the next six months. Um, thirdly, the report just draws to your attention the new regime with the Building Safety Regulator, which is, sits alongside but different to, um, to, the, to the consumer standards and the significant work that we're doing to ensure compliance with the Building Safety Act and, um, and particularly focusing on um, our high-rise buildings, but not exclusively. Um, and I'm pleased to be able to say that we are so far meeting all the deadlines that uh, the new um, regulatory regime requires of us, and that is about to step up as we start to submit um, building safety cases for, for um, our highest um, risk buildings. And then lastly, um, the report references and makes a, makes, um, a link to um, our tenant satisfaction measures, the TSMs, the, the statutory um, measures that are reported on an annual basis. Um, and those will be, because they're submitted by every landlord, they will obviously be fully benchmarkable when those benchmarks are published, we expect, in, in the autumn, and so quite imminently. So um, I hope that gives quite a rounded picture and very happy to take questions I, through myself or, or my colleague. Thank you very much for your presentation. We'll now move to questions and comments. Uh, Councillor Cousins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I think I need to say a great a big congratulation, a great congratulations, a big congratulations on this piece of work. I think it was um, 
it, it, I suppose it goes to the culture of, of the organization a bit that we were brave enough to do the self-referral and that was how your tenure as, as leader started chair and I think that I, I can remember it was a bit of a, uh, we, we, you know, we, you know, we felt a little bit ooh inside, but it had to be done. And I, I think it's another culture about this particular cabinet. We are bold when we need to and brave enough to take these um, important um, decisions and follow through. So it's great to see the outcome and the progress made. What I did want to ask, though, just the, well, not just me, but I think it, as it's in the tabulation on page number four of the item six page number four as it, as the as it said at the bottom of that page they have got the tabulation of all the actions and, and progress made i'm just noticing for the electrical one just if you can say a little bit more about the dip in the second year in march 2023 with the electrical com communal electrical works where the certification went down from 31.8 percent to 17 point <laughs> 17.4 percent i'm assuming it's possibly certificates expiring but it just rather than guessing it's just for you to please explain that thank you just before i bring officers in it's on the section on current performance are there any other questions because i'm going to take it in a round councillor lolivar uh, thank you very much. And in a similar vein, um, a huge recognition, I think, to the officers on their work on this. Um, I think um, in this current climate, it's really reassuring, I think, to see that, that this kind of, that A, the safe of self, self referral, but also the work that's been done to make sure our residents are safe. Um, and the question would be just, I would really, I very much welcome the damper mold team. It's something that's really important to our residents and I think is, comes up um, uh, uh, consistently. Um, if you could just speak a little bit about how that team's helped with those wait times, because I think that, and that improvement around performance, because I think that's something that was really, really key. And just lastly, a, a question for me, uh, before I bring in Councillor L uh, Lacau, um, on, on this, uh, again, I almost remember uh, my first conversation uh, with the chief exec on uh, uh, having to self-refer ourselves to the regulator on day one of my leadership. Um, so I'm happy to be able to see the update in terms of where we are now because it's a huge improvement on the big six. So well done to you and your team. I guess the question is how are we ensuring that we continuously communicate with residents on where we are on this? And secondly, in the context of where we are, and where we need to get to even further. Do we envision using part of our capital uh, budgets to be able to do that? Is there any additional resources the council will need to accelerate some of the works to make sure that we're compliant as can be with the regulator? And then we'll go back for Councillor Cloud's question. I'll just go to officers for a response. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chair. Um, so just to answer those questions in order, um, I think the, where the communal blocks are reduced for two reasons. One, uh, when we first reported ourselves to regulator of social housing, we knew we had issues uh, and we did a thorough audit of what we actually had and what we actually knew. So where before we might have thought it was 31%, when you go through each one of those certificates, checked it's correct, checked it's signed correctly, uh, and ensured you have a full and compliant certificate, we would have found actually for some of those certificates we didn't have. So it was a root and branch review and uh, not just on uh, communal blocks, but on domestic blocks as well. We had people literally going through every single EICR that we have to make sure it was a correct and, 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 and thorough and thorough really filled out EICR to make sure we had the right number and that's how we end up with 7,000 on domestic. Um, so, and also some of them would have gone out of time within that period as well. So that, that would have been the drop, but it was that, that real um, thoroughness that we went through to make sure when we say something, it's actually true. Uh, and just give members assurance that now actually every single one of our blocks has had uh, an EICR. Uh, there's outstanding actions that need to be done so we can have a compliant EICR, but every one of our blocks uh, where required has had an electrician go in, do a test, understand what works need to be done, and we're working through those works at the moment. So that's, I think, really important to say. Uh, we're not 100% yet, but we know what needs to be done. We know what the issues are, and we're, and we're working through that process. So <laughs> I think that's positive. Uh, damper mould, I think, is, a, uh, is quite a success story uh, for, for the authority, and we've been, um, there's a regular uh, members repairs uh, group that Councillor Slattery chairs every few months where we go and explain what we're doing in the repair service. 
uh, and we've been updating that group regularly uh, to see what we've been doing in damp and mould. Uh, there's been a myriad of, uh, of activities we've done, such as um, looking at the end-to-end -end process, speaking to residents about what they want, uh, redesigning the service, implementing in the contact centre a new triage system so we can identify vulnerable residents right at the start, uh, and there has been more resource and a new team uh, in damp and mould. What we've seen there is, uh, and it's variable depending on the time of year, depending on how many um, you know, damp and mould uh, queries we've had uh, that month, but we've seen a reduction from, say, people waiting months for somebody to come around and address the damp and mould to people waiting days or, or weeks at most for somebody to do that. And especially where we have vulnerable residents, I think the last report I saw, we were getting around there within around three days, three working days to residents to see what the problem is, clear the damp and mould if needed, uh, and look at the underlying issues within five days so we can raise, uh, raise repairs and, uh, and tackle the issues. So the council, with this investment, and, and it's not been cheap, it, it's had a real investment in this area, uh, and it's really seen an improvement for residents in, in those turnaround times. So I think that's a real, a, a real positive. Um, regarding uh, communications, uh, Chair, we are, um, when we first reported the regulator of social housing, uh, we did a big uh, communications piece with all residents, let us know if you have any issues, let us know if there's any priorities, let us know if there's anything you're worried about. Uh, and actually, we didn't get that much engagement back from residents on that, which was, was interesting. We thought we'd open a, open a floodgate and, and um, we'd have lots of complaints, lots of inquiries, but actually it was very, very little. We've continued to keep those um, communication channels open for residents. We've continued to, to uh, advertise in things like um, talk housing every, every um, quarter and put updates in about... Um, uh, where we are with compliance and probably key to note as well that on building safety cases we'll be going out, out on our high-rise buildings we'll be going out to residents very soon to, to talk to them about what do you want to know about your building how do you want us to communicate what's the most useful way that we can communicate with you so we can get these really key messages across so you know if there is unfortunately a, a fire in your block you know exactly what to do you know what's keeping you safe and you know how to how to behave in those situations and we can tell you how we're keeping you safe in those situations so a lot more communications work uh, to do uh, and to come, and I forgot what the fourth question was. Oh, sorry. And the financial part, I, I think it's probably um, uh, really key to say that um, we have spent considerable amounts of money in correcting um, the. Uh, the uh, issues that we had and I think there's areas such as fire safety where it, it, it's it's not been a lack of funding it's not been a lack of capital investment uh, that has caused us not to be as, as, as quick as we want closing some of those actions the industry as a whole is in a very difficult place and it's not just about throwing money at, at, at the problem um, we are one of many many councils many many housing associations that require these resources for fire safety for electrical safety etc and we are uh, sometimes in, in a bidding war with other other organizations to try and try and get these resources in so at the moment it's live conversations and we do have considerable capital fund and revenue fund um, being spent on um, uh, on compliance issues but it's not necessarily somewhere where we need more money it's a difficult marketplace that we're uh, that we're working in which is um, the situation thank you councillor Lacau. Thank you. Um, I think that last point is something I wanted to just um, tweak out a little bit more because I just wanted to understand whether you're having to divert staff from the day-to-day -day, um, repairs and so on to do some of this compliance work because this is very important. I mean, I've absolutely no doubt and given the um, speed, I'd say, at which you've worked um, and the great results that we're seeing, um, it must have taken a lot of um, resource um, for that. So I, I just wondered if um, whilst we're really doing well here, are we doing it at the expense of um, our day-to-day -day, um, work? The other question I wanted to ask is around the stock condition survey. Um, when was the last one that was done? How have we used that information to support some of the work that you're doing now? Um, and are we at the point where we need to be doing another one, particularly as the regulations are t changing? Um, thank you. Thank you very much. And just my final question in, in addition to that, obviously we have a notice, a, a live notice at the moment where do we envision conversations are with the regulator about finally being in a position whereby 
uh, we're having the conversation about having dealt with the actions, the notice is withdrawn, and when do we envision getting to a place where we can be in that position? And lastly, in light of the current legislation and changes, Councillor Lacau touched on this uh, briefly, I, I understand this report will also be going to scrutiny, to be scrutinised. It might be worth thinking about um, how we brief members about the assurance framework and the things that they need to be looking out for. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you both. So day-to-day -day staff generally haven't been um, used uh, for these works. A lot of these works are specialist works, uh, and therefore, for example, fire safety works, you have to be an accredited um, organization to be able to do fire safety work. So we've contracted most of that work out because it takes a lot, of, uh, it takes a lot to become accredited to fire safety works. And whereby we've had our electrical program, um, we had three contractors come into the borough to help us to do that. Uh, realistically, to get through, uh, we've, we've done around 12,000 electrical installation condition reports over 18 months. We never could have achieved that with our own staff members. Uh, however, we have used our staff members uh, in certain areas where we've seen, for example, the, the, the communal blocks where we've been a bit slow on that program. Uh, we've used our own staff members to, to do some of the ICRs on, on there. So generally, the, none of this has been at the expense of day-to-day -day, uh, repairs work. Uh, it's generally been uh, service contracts out because you need that, that, that specialism. Um, stock condition surveys, the last major stock condition survey was 2017. It was done by um, Savills uh, back then. Uh, and we've got that data and we used uh, a lot of that data to design the new capital program that um, Cabinet signed off a few years ago now, I think it was. Um, that's not to say that we're not always updating that information. Our own surveyors have been going out and, and day in, day out, kind of when they capture information that's been fed into the system as well. And we're taking a new approach whereby within our capital program, as we are validating our capital program, so you say that block needs kitchens and bathrooms done. As our, as survey, as our uh, consultants, our surveyors are going in to validate that work, they're also updating stock condition data at the same time. So we're basically using a visit for two reasons, validating the capital program that um, needs to be done and whether it needs to be done, but also capturing stock condition uh, data as well. Uh, and there's a big piece of work at the moment we're doing um, to capture all the stock condition data we've got, understand what we know about the um, energy performance of our stock, EPCs of our stock, and also feeding repairs data to that to give us a holistic view of which are our worst performing properties, which are our properties in the, in the worst repair, and therefore can we point the capital program at those first and fix the worst first uh, moving forward. But that's in a backdrop of, you know, um, difficult financial situation for the uh, for the entirety of the council, so a lot of a lot of things that need to be done there. Sorry, um, on the notice chair, I it's very I've, I've said this before. It's very difficult to say. The, the regulator of social housing uh, will decide when they are ready to lift the notice. We found out uh, in conversation with them the other day. Uh, they were clear that actually what happens is when we believe we are ready to lift the notice, the chief exec writes them a letter to say we believe we have met the requirements of the notice and we would like you to consider uh, moving that notice. It feels like, and I'd, I'd rather not be held to this in a sense, but it feels like we should be there in the next three to six months of writing that letter. Um, however, we've got to see how, how, how uh, that uh, plays out. And at the moment... Uh, to give members some assurance as part of the assurance framework and the third part of the assurance framework is that we ask for external, we're going to have external audits done and we'll have an external audit complete at the moment by Savills to come in and assess our service to make sure that everything we're representing to ourselves, to the regulator, to members is validated externally and if that, if that um, audit comes back positively then I think it, it's a really strong way that we can be saying to the regulator you've seen continued improvement from ourselves, we've had this validated externally and therefore we think it's time that we should be looking to lift this uh, regulatory notice. But once again, it's not within our gift to, uh, to be able to say when that is. Thank you very much uh, for your questions. And can I just make one amendment to the report on page 53, where it gives uh, the diagram of the assurance process, uh, just changing housing deliveries, the housing strategy. Yeah, thank you very much. Now, colleagues, I recognize uh, that um, Many of you in the room would have seen this report before. For some of you, you would have seen it um, at, at the Housing Strategy Board, where we had the opportunity to pour in more detail uh, over it. Uh, and this also that this is also going to scrutiny as well. 
uh, at some point to be further scrutinized by our critical friends. Uh, so we invite all of you to attend that meeting where you can and contribute where possible, because obviously uh, it's important that our assurance framework is taken seriously to make sure we protect and safeguard our residents. Um, we'll now move, uh, did it, one comment? Just, sorry, I'll just bring in Councillor Cow for one comment. I'm really sorry. Um, so just to pick up those two issues. So firstly, um, we designed a new triage system um, in our call center. So when people call up about damp and mold, uh, it takes people through a, a list of questions which identify certain, do you have a, a child under three? Do you have uh, any disabilities? So it asks a raft of questions which can help identify vulnerabilities. That was designed with residents. It's been piloted for about three or four months now and we continue this learning loop of is it working? What's it teaching us? Speaking to both residents and also speaking to the service delivering those repairs, was it identifying vulnerability correctly? What were we seeing when we went into those homes? So there's a feedback loop on that. So it's a, it's a triage at the front end that we are continuing to learn from, uh, but it, is, it does seem to be identifying those vulnerable residents and they are, they are getting, a, getting a quick service. Um, on the second point, yes, we have information from uh, adult social care and we're tying into the systems they have to, to talk about our high-rise blocks and what we know, but also part of the communications piece that I spoke about is we'll be uh, writing to all residents in those blocks and say, let us know if you have a disability, door knocking, uh, open days, etc., trying to really get an understanding of who lives in those blocks. We knew this three years ago, has anything changed? Really understanding because we want to make sure that absolutely that, where there's vulnerability we've identified, it. We've taken that into consideration and as part of the building safety cases that we have to submit, we know this, we've taken it into account and we've mitigated any risk uh, because of that. So lots of work coming up on, on that, Councillor. Thank you. Right. Um, are members happy to agree to the decisions as outlined in section 1.1 to 1.6 of the report? Thank you very much, and this will go to scrutiny next. Item 7, contracts and standing orders, <laughs> exemptions, variations from the 1st of January 2024 to the 30th of June 2024 to note the summary of waivers and variations for contracts and standing orders. I'll now hand over to the Cabinet Member for Finance, Resources and Social Value to open and present the report. Thank you so much, Chair. Uh, this report is presented to Cabinet to set out a list of contracts that have either been procured as single tenders, which are the waivers, or modified, which are the variations, during the period that the leader mentioned, July last year to June. Now, whilst a competitive process is preferred to establish a contract in most scenarios, there are also a number of valid reasons why contracts may be awarded without undergoing a formal competitive process. And this is allowed within RBG governance and provided for under current legislation. A variation may be just a simple extension to a contract or it may be as a result of increasing or decreasing the services or the supplies that will be provided. And the report sets out the details of each waiver or variation according to dates, reasons, and the financial impact. Cabinet may wish to note one significant item which was the direct award of contract to Elite Landscapes Limited for 
10,425,000 for the Woolwich Public Realm Works, which includes Powers Street and Beresford Square. This was a, as a result of insolvency of the original prime contractor, where Elite was actually a key subcontractor working on the site. And although the award itself is for considerable value, the 10.5 million, this has actually just been increased in the budget to completion by less than 1%. And I'd like to thank all the officers in Dres that actually brought about this happy resolution to a very unhappy situation. And this now enables the works to be completed two timescale in accordance with the grant funding conditions for this marvellous project. And Chair, with your forbearance, I'd like to commend this report for noting by the Cabinet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not convinced we need an officer report because I thought that was sufficient. Um, and also thank you for drawing out the points on one of the more substantial figures in the report and giving us the narrative to understand the reasons and the decisions uh, for why it's at that point. Um, I don't see any indication of questions or comments, but I presume this report is also going to scrutiny as well uh, at some point or some stage uh, to be further scrutinized. So there'll be the opportunity to further pour over this. And I know we've had the opportunity to look at this report before as well. Um, so are members happy to agree the decisions as outlined in section one point? Oh, oh yep, comments? Um, I just wanted to echo Councillor Highland's comments on the um, contract that was awarded for the town centre works. Um, you know, as cabinet member for business, I think it was absolutely essential that we didn't. Um, you know, we all know that those works are causing some disruption, and you can't do works of that kind without some disruption. But the fact that we've been able to um, make sure that the appointing of the new contractor keeps the project to time is pretty essential for those businesses and to our residents that use the town centre that have had to kind of put up with the disruption too. Um, and we're all looking forward to the completion next year when um, all will be revealed and I'm sure that everyone will appreciate that disruption has been worthwhile. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Smith. And I think a point well made, especially where we're seeing lots of contractors going bust around the con country and they're, where they're delivering construction projects. So again, thanks to the team for their effort and work and uh, Councillor Raman and Councillor Smith for your joint work on this as well. Uh, we're all collectively uh, grateful. I will now move to answer the question. Are members happy to agree the decisions as outlined in section 1.1? Thank you very much. That concludes the meeting uh, and takes us right up onto the hour uh, from when we started where we were delayed with technical difficulties. Thank you for everyone for your time.